you invest in three million quid in a coin that doesn't exist, that has absolutely no security whatsoever at the minute. It could disappear. It could disappear. Could, yeah. It could double, treble, ten times overnight, but it could also disappear. Why not put your three million quid in something that you can touch and drive and enjoy and love, and if it falls by 50% in value and the world ends and we go to war and you've still, that's yours, you've still got it. You know, you're not going to turn on your computer one day and it just be gone. And I think for that reason, um, people are buying big investment cars for that kind of reason. There's, there's so much money out there, especially in the UK. There's so much money in the UK. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Carl, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate that. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, no problem. So obviously, Carl, you're one of the one of the UK's biggest, I'd say, prestigious car dealers. I'm not going to say just supercars because you have so many different types of cars, right? How the hell did it all get started? Okay, so uh, it's a family business. Yeah. So my father started the business 48 years ago. He's got a, a long, great story, how he started the business. His life has been um, a bit of a roller coaster up and down. He's been through all sorts. And he, he actually wrote an autobiography um, a couple of years ago, which was like one of the best sellers on Amazon for, for a business um, autobiography, which is good. I should have brought you on down. He started the business a long time ago. Long story short, fast forward, you know, 25 years. Um, I left school at 11 years old. <sighs> I didn't want to do anything else in life but just be my dad, basically. You know, I just wanted to buy and sell cars. I just had such a buzz for cars. What 11-year-old doesn't love cars who's been brought up around cars, you know? And the buzz for cars sort of quickly vanished, and I got more of a buzz for business than what I did actual cars. At what age is this? Where, uh, where, it, where it diminished? And 14. 14? Okay. Yeah, 14, 15. I, um, I, as soon as I started driving them, I used to drive when I was 14. Fourteen. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. On car parks or actually? no, no, no. I, I like I. I used to. It was. I was at work full time. Right. And you know, if I went to buy a car for Lewis Morgan, I would have to take two drivers. But sometimes I wouldn't buy the car because there'd be something wrong with it, or I wouldn't be happy with it, or we couldn't agree on a price. So you know, you think how much you pay a member of staff a day. I'm taking two plus me out the office for a day. It just didn't work. And I thought, you know what? I'm just. Fuck it. <laughs> and um, I started, I just bought, bought a few cars, started driving them back. Then my dad found out that I was driving um, on the road and he was like, you know, y you can't do this. You're going to get in trouble. And I was like, look, I had no choice. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. And then it just got more of a regular occurrence and then everyone just accepted that that was that. And plus, I had an older brother, so my older brother was four years older than me. So I think half the time people just kind of thought, if they passed me in the village, that was him, you know. Right. So Is he involved in the business? He used to be involved in the business. We used to, all three of us used to work together and did until maybe six years ago. Right, okay. Yeah, me and my brother and my dad used to, um, we, were, we were in business together for, for you know, for a long time. Um, my brother had a, uh, I think he had a, a different vision of what where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do with cars. And he um, he went after that vision. And, you know, he's uh, he's... From what I can see, he's doing an incredible, incredible job at it. So is he still in? So he's still in business now, trading under a different name. But yeah, w we trade under Tom Hartley Cars. He's Tom Hartley Junior. It can right. get quite confusing. Yeah, that's what conf I was googling before, and that was what confused me a little yeah. bit. But th the thing that doesn't confuse it too much is, um, say seventy-five percent of our stock is new modern supercars, and say 75% of my brother's stock is classic, vintage, investment, could be uh, you know, a, a 60s Ferrari or even a, a Formula One car from the 60s and 70s. So it's, it's a very different market, but still doing cars, yeah. you know? So um, our paths cross a, a, a lot, and we do business together a bit, which is, which is good, um, but it's not, it's not like we're in direct competition buying and selling the same thing every day, because that would be... Yeah, hard. It would be hard. Well, it'd be good because <laughs> he's probably the the fiercest competitor I've been against. Right. So um, it's uh, it, you know competition's good. How's it been working with your family? Um, I don't really know any different. So, like I say, I left school at a very early age. I went into business with my brother and my dad. 
Um, and I think if I was to go into business with somebody else, I don't think I'd last five minutes with that person. You know, you need to have like this diehard trust with somebody when you're in business with them, I think, you know, because they, they're, they're handling 50% of your life, you know? Um, and I don't trust anyone as much as I trust my family. So um, I like, you know, it's, it's hard. We have days where we, uh, where we fall out. But, you know, me and my dad, we work together well. How do you get over falling out? Business is business. Yeah. We don't make it personal. So it, it's business. I could have an argument with him over a business deal that I would have an argument with you over. It means nothing. After, after business is done, it's, you're still my dad. Do you find that hard to separate at uh, points? Yeah, because this business has always been for me and us as a family, it's a lifestyle. It's not you get up and go to work. You get up and you just carry on with your life and your life consists of constantly trying to buy and sell things. So it doesn't like work doesn't end. So you can't you can't separate it. But what you do have to separate is I fell out with you earlier because I think you made a wrong business decision or vice versa. But that's got nothing to do with us having dinner tonight around the dinner table. You know, that's that's father and son family where before we were business partners. When was the last time you actually made a friend? When was the last time I actually made a friend? A that's new, a good a question. A new friend. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I know what you mean by that question when you say friend. Because um, obviously I do business with people every day who I get along with and you yeah, speak yeah. to them. But, you know, they're nice, but they're not your friend. I might only have five friends, you know. The last time I made a friend was probably 20 years ago. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? It's quite yeah. sad. I oh, know it is. So, it, but it's the same for me too. I haven't made a friend for f forever. Yeah. I haven't made a friend recently. No, I probably may never will because it's really hard, as you say, to trust people. It's hard to get th to get them past that boundary. But a lot of acquaintances or people you get on with, there's a lot of those people. But like in the friend category, I try and tough. get on with everybody, and and I'm lucky that I meet a lot of people I've got a, a lot in common with in this business. They come to me, they buy a car, they could do a complete other business, but they love cars, they, they love business, they, they love sports, they love stuff like that, and you get on with them. But like you say, you know, to make an actual friend friend, the last time I probably made a friend, thinking about it now, was about 12 years ago. And this is a guy who um, is, I class as a very, 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 very good friend. And I met him through business. I met him through buying a car from him. And we've just become very close. And now my wife and his wife, are good friends as well. They've just done a skydive together in in, oh, du right. in Dubai. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over the palm. Over the palm. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could, uh, could you do that? I done it. Oh, I couldn't do that. Uh, so I I had this thing where um, I always had in my head because I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie to to an extent, but I'm scared of everything. You know, like I want to do loads of stuff, but I just ain't got the balls. You know, <laughs> so I wanted to skydive. So I want to do this for years. Got in, got to Dubai, and it, you know it wasn't a, a thought that just came in my head. I actually thought about it before we went. I thought I'm going to get over there and do a skydive. My wife's a panicker, big panicker. She didn't care what I'd done before kids, ride motorbikes, do whatever we wanted to do. But as soon as we had kids, like a lot of it had to stop, which is good. She's a sensible one. So I'm around the pool. I'm sitting around the pool with a guy that I sold a car to, and we just met. We were sat next to each other on two um, on two sun lounges, and he said, "Oh, he said his car, isn't it?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I bought a car from you three or four years ago. Oh, my, he was from Scotland. Nice guy." So we've had two buckets of Coronas, and um, I said, "You know what I'm going to do?" I said, "What?" I said, "I'm going to do a skydive." He went, "What well, here?" I said, "Yeah, hi, right, I'll do it with you." I said, "Like I'm not about doing it like on Saturday. Like today's Thursday. Like uh, there's a space on Saturday. I'm going to do it on Saturday. Hi, right, I'll do it." <laughs> okay, so booked us both on. So I thought, I can't tell my Mitzi, my wife, I can't tell her, she's just going to go mad. So I said to her, she, I got up, got dressed that morning, she said, where are you going? So I'm going to play golf with um, a guy I met around the pool. All right then, okay, what time are you back? I said, I don't know, five or six hours or something? All right, no problem. Got in a taxi, got to the, um, got to the skydive, skydive Dubai, and done it. So then I sent her a picture afterwards, because you'll get pictures and videos and stuff. And I sent her a picture afterwards, and I said, I didn't really go and play golf. And sent her a picture of me jumping out of the plane. Well, she didn't speak to me for three days. <laughs> for th ruin the holiday. <laughs> Absolutely ruin the holiday. So we're having an argument. The kids are in, um, um, what's the thing called? 
the play school thing that the that the, the hotels have. Kids club. Right. Kids are in kids club. And we were having a meal. And she still wasn't speaking to me. And I'm like, I said, look, I said, you're going to ruin the holiday. No, you've ruined the holiday. You jumped out of an aeroplane. I said, well, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't even kiss me. You didn't say goodbye. You know, I, I would have let you do it. But, I, you know, you know, I worry about you and blah, blah, blah. So she said, how would you feel if I'd done it? You know, what would go through your mind if I, if I jumped out of an aeroplane? So I said, well, it was possibly the best experience of my life. I said, I, 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 I want you to do it. You should do it. I recommend it. Yeah, well, maybe I will, she said. All right, so as we're having dinner, I'm on my phone. She thinks I'm emailing or something. All right. You're doing it on Wednesday. Doing what? So you're just skydiving on Wednesday. What, here, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, she 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 done it. She went through with it. Oh, wow. Yeah. What was it like going up, thinking I'm going to jump out of this plane? Do you know what? Um, it's, it's a long story. And if we've got time, I'll tell you, you can edit it out if it's boring. It's dropping, um, yeah. But so, got to... The, Book the book the thing. Next day I've woke up, which is the day after we've booked it, which is the day before I'm actually doing it. Oh, God, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I couldn't breathe. Like, all day long, I just was panicking. I was just seriously stressing out. Because I'm one of these people, if I say I'm going to do something, like, I do it. I don't care if it kills me. I have to do it. I've, I've promised this person who I was sat next to that I'm going to do it. And um, panicked, panicked, panicked all day. The next day, I got up, and I was like, right, but this is it. Whatever happens today happens. I'm not going to not do it. So I had a completely different frame of mind. I was just accept. I just I had acceptance of whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And the guy that I had, um, uh, the tandem guy that I had, oh man, he was so funny. He was the funniest guy from South Africa. Right. And um, as you've watched the, the the thing, you know, the tutorial video. You've watched it all and they're all jumping out of an aeroplane and the woman's a beautiful woman who's jumping out with this superhero of a guy and everyone's smiling and high-fiving like, you know, oh, this is lovely. But it doesn't happen like that. Like, you have a fucking meltdown when you're up there and you, you abuse everybody and you just panic or pass out or whatever. So um, I said to this guy, I said, look, there is no way am I not doing this today. I said, but I'm going to need your help. You've got to get me out of the plane. Okay, no problem got the harness on me everyone else is kneeling down on the floor or like laid on their stomach on the floor practicing how they put their arms out and stuff and me and this guy is just talking about cars he's like oh hey man yeah you know in south africa we have some nice cars and blah 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 and he was talking about cars and i said shouldn't i be leroy's name was i said leroy i said shouldn't i be doing this what they're doing oh no man Thirteen thousand feet that ain't gonna save you so i was like okay great so now we're in the plane as soon as the plane took off, I couldn't wait to get out the plane. The plane was like, do you know Only Fools and Horses um, three-wheel car that they have? That was basically the plane, right? It's double side, shell. Just absolute. I mean, there was no way this plane safe. No way this plane safe. I had double-sided, 3M double-sided um, tape that we used to stick number plates on a car on the roof. Yeah? And I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to jump out this plane. I need to get out this plane. So... I'm second to go, so I don't know why I've done this. I shouldn't have done it, really, but the doors opened. As the doors opened, it's, it's May in Dubai. It's roasting 36 degrees on the floor, but it's freezing. I mean, it's so cold when the door opens. It's unbelievable. It's like the Arctic. Well, how many thousand feet is it? Was it like 13. 12? 13, yeah. So doors open. A guy's got to, the, got to the edge. As he's got to the edge... I just, I got about this far from him and I just looked in his face because I just wanted to see what he, I want to see his emotions, yeah. you know? And he was so terrified. <laughs> he, was, he was absolutely, I mean, he was, he was petrified. <laughs> and next thing you know, he, they jumped and you couldn't even see them. Like he just went into the abyss. Like he just, it was like dropping a stone in the ocean. You, know? you couldn't even see it. So my guy was like, Carl, come on, we're next. All right, no problem. So I'm like, Leroy, I said, before we go, because obviously you've got to shout, it's so loud. I said, before we go, um, this harness, I said, can it be a bit tighter? It's a bit loose. So he's got me, he went, he said, oh man, he said, I fucked up. He said, I picked up a large, I should have picked up a medium. He said, just hang on a bit tighter, <laughs> right? And I'm like, what? Three, two, and then bang, we're off. And I'm, I'm, my emotions that I've got at this point is like, oh my God, what have I done? I can't get, I can't take it back, but what have I done? And then he, tap, he taps on your shoulder about 
seven or eight seconds into the first fall and it gets you to open your arms up. As soon as you open your arms, it's the best feeling I've ever really? felt. It's incredible. So what was the fir- what was that first like a few seconds as oh, you jumped out just, the plane? Just launch? like just terror. <laughs> just just I don't wish that feeling on anybody. Right. It is absolute absolute hell. Was it like a, did it feel like a you know like a drop tower? You know what I mean? You yeah. Jump, if but if but you you don't you've never dropped long enough. You, you when you drop in one of them drop towers or whatever, y- your guts I call it they they, they go up and down. You yeah. feel it, yeah. They don't go back up. You know. So you fall and there's no, you just stable out. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you still get that feeling, but it, it's that feeling in the most exaggerating way. You go from zero to 200 miles an hour in like a second and a half. And then you fall at 200 miles an hour for one minute. But when your arms are open and you've got no sense of anything around you because you're falling through the sky, you're not passing anything. You don't know how fast you fall. You feel like you're static. Yeah. You know? Right. And um, th- you completely, I completely forgot about the parachute opening. Like, obviously, your biggest fear is, is the parachute going to open, yeah? If you were guaranteed tomorrow to have a safe landing, you'd skydive. But it's always in the back of your mind, even though... They've got ha- two shoots, though, haven't they? I think they've got, they got, they got two shoots, but you don't want to be relying on the second shoot. Right, yeah, um, true. And um, it's just the greatest thing in the world. And I'll tell you what is scary, what I find was scary is when the parachute opens, you're still like 5,000 feet from the floor, just floating with nothing underneath you. Like, you wouldn't paraglide 5,000 feet up in the sky, would you? That was scary for me. And I said to, the, I said to this guy, I was like, Leroy, you've got to get me down. He was like, oh, okay, man, we'll do a, a performance landing. He turned they the... They spin, don't they? Oh. To come down fast. Then after three seconds of that, I was like, no, no, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> <laughs> so... It was one of them things, you know, when you, you when you conquer something, you think, wow, I want to do that again. Yeah. I did not think that. Right, okay. As soon as I got on the floor, if someone said to me, do you want to do it again? I said, no, I'm never doing that again. And I'm never doing it again. When my wife, when I took my wife back two days later to do it with a friend of mine's wife, they got up in the plane and he said, um, go on, you mean you do it? Because he's, he's done it before as well. I said, you couldn't give me Dubai to get back in that airplane. You couldn't give me Dubai to get back in that airplane. I'm just not doing it. Would you be even? Would you be even more scared going up the second time than you were the first time? Because I know what I know, know what I going. know what's in that plane. Right. That plane is a scary place. Yeah. But um, the guy I done it with had nine thousand jumps. Yeah, they're always South African as well. They're always the ones New that do Zealand, all the South African, Australian. Mm. He's in the um, the we were telling me he's in the, he's in the top thirty in the world. I don't know how they get classed, but he's in the top thirty of the world, and he's at the world championships. Um, this year in in, a, in America somewhere, right. Alabama or somewhere. Um, I think they must have to do tricks or something when they fall out or, or whatever. But, um, you know, he, he, I was recommended to go with him. And I know why now. The guy, he just he just took the piss out of me for an hour. Like, he just absolutely ripped me for an hour. Would you ever, would you ever take a trip to the moon? If you could. Or Mars or whatever it may be in the future. Um, I, think in, I think in our lives, hopefully... Um, it will be a thing you you will be able to. Do. I mean, at the minute you can do it, but it costs what ten million dollars or, or whatever, yeah, ridiculous. or a hundred million dollars or whatever it is. But I think at some point in our life, in the next fifty years, if we're lucky enough to make it fifty years, there'll be an opportunity to to do it. Would I do it? Um, yeah, why not? Would you have done it before the? Would you have done it years ago? Or since I wouldn't have done it before a skydive. Right. Okay. No, 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 d- yeah. definitely not. But uh, you know, if you fall from a ledge that's eight feet up. You can you 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 can you can die you can die easily. So what makes a difference if you're eight feet or eighty thousand feet or eight miles? It makes no difference. And what an experience, you know, to see see that. What would be um, an example of a poor business decision for your company? A poor business decision would be um, mostly buying of stock or selling something or underselling something. So we are we're very we're very old fashioned, and we the mentality is profit is good. You keep making money, you keep making profit, you move on. Fresh money fi- buys fresh goods, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good to undersell something. You know, if I've got a feeling for a car, and I think right they're undervalued, I'm gonna wait a couple of months before I put that for sale, and it could increase by fifteen or twenty percent in that time because I think it might do. Someone could come along 
with an offer to a member of staff or my dad or, or something. And it's, it's, only, it's only me and my dad that make a decision, but my dad can make a decision. He could look at the buying in figure. He could look at the selling figure and go, okay, wow, that was good. That was good profit. Sell it, get it gone. Where a bad decision is in two months, that car could have been 15 or 20% more that I thought it was going to be. That was my view when I bought it. So that can cause stress and that works both ways you know that that works both ways or one of us might buy a car and we'll we always discuss everything with each other one of us could buy a car and say you know how much do you think that's worth we always have this conversation after we've bought the car so we're on their way back in the car and we'll say like hey how much do you think that 812 gts is worth and somebody will say you probably paid 360 for it and someone will say i don't know 320 330 and you're like, no, no, I could just give 360. And you're like, 360? I could have bought that one last week for 330, and we never bought it. And, you know, it's just, it's just life, and it? It's just stuff like that. Why don't you discuss the, the price you're buying before you buy? Because we, we, live, <laughs> we live on the same estate together. We work in the same building together. I probably see him for combined an hour and a half a week. <laughs> All right, okay. We don't see each other. I'm always out. He's always out. If I'm in, he's out. If he's in, I'm out. Um, getting in touch with me is hard. Getting in touch with him is harder. Um, and it, at the end of the day, it really makes no difference. If he's got something in his head, regardless to what I say, it's going to happen. And vice versa. If I've got something in my head, regardless of what anyone says, I've made the decision, I've made it. You know, I'm I'm discussing it with you, but I'm not asking for your advice as such you know yeah i suppose you don't really i suppose in, in your game let's say you don't really have to you're buying a car for the right price and hopefully selling it for a but this goes back to when i said working with family it's a trust thing you know i trust whatever decision he makes is going to be the right decision for both of us as does he it's a tr it's, it's a flat out trust trust with your life i don't know if i could do that with somebody else yeah because you've never worked in that i think you definitely can trust people obviously what you're saying, I've got... I've just had no experience with it. That's what I mean, you've had yeah. no experience with it, but I mean, you know, some people have been in business with family. Again, uh, people always ask me, how do you trust people? It all depends on the person. You can trust your family and then, then they can go off, start drinking or yeah, speak yeah. to the wrong people and then end up taking your money, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of families that thief between them and that goes for strangers too. So it's, it's one of them things that trust us takes, it, you can break it in a second and you can spend a lot of time trying to build it. The car business is a great business um, to... To, to learn business in because it's a cutthroat business. There, there really is, not so much now, but, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, um, it's, 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 you know, a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It, it really is. Someone, someone would do you over a pound, you know? And um, I think something's changed where people have become more loyal, customers have become more loyal, other dealers... There's so there's so many shit dealers out there at the minute. I mean, it is awful, but it's good for me because it makes our job easier. But what contributes to a shit dealer? Oh, you know, people who don't do what they say. That contributes to a, a, a shit person and a shit businessman, in my opinion. People who don't do what they say. If you do what you say and you pay what you pay when you say you're going to do it, why, why would that person not come back to you? They're going to come back in three months, in six months, in 12 months. You know, what people, people in the car business, they do two things. They look at a way to make a quick buck and don't care how the customer might feel about it. But that customer's never going to come back, so that bridge is burnt. Or they tell lies to people. They see Lewis Morgan. Lewis Morgan wants to sell his car. And he calls up a dealer that doesn't want to buy his car because not many dealers actually buy cars. So he doesn't want to buy the car, but he says to Lewis, you know what? How much do you want for it? So Lewis says, well, I'm not really in the car business. I don't really know. But I paid X, Y, Z, and I want my money back. And they go, oh, you know, it's not worth anything like that. They know it's not worth anything like that. But how good would that car look in the showroom? It might help us sell other cars that we've got in our showroom. So they promise you an unrealistic offer. Three, three months later, your car's devalued now by 5% in that three months. And you've still got it. There's some people with, who, who have finance on cars, they've paid three months worth of payments, plus their car's devalued, plus they've missed the summer,
because somebody told them a lie who they trusted. So you can't you can't buy trust. You can only earn it, and it takes a lot longer to earn than what it does to lose. Yeah, that's so true. But what you said about people potentially buying cars f- to sit in their showroom. Yeah, I've done deals with some people before, and they've had n- minimal network, and my car's been sat there for a, a long, long time. And mine's probably was the best car they were selling. Silly by me. I, I think in any business, and this doesn't just apply to 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 ours, but I think in any business. Um, you go to what you call a professional, okay? And you don't know more than that professional because you've gone to them. You're asking for their advice. What do you think my car's worth? What do you think I should do with it? What can I do with it? When, when you're telling them what you want them to do with your car or you're telling them what you think it's worth, that's when, that's when mistakes happen. You know, I, I'd like to feel like nobody outside of the car trade could tell me what a car's worth because it's insulting to my job. It's what I've dedicated my whole life to. And somebody who's bought one car thinks he knows more than me. I bet you get that all the time. Oh, yeah, I, I get it all the time. I had a guy the other day tell me, I know this is the best color and I know this is the best spec. And I see them, obviously, and another misconception is what people see a car advertised for. They like to say, I've seen what they're going for as in what they're selling for. They're not selling for that price. Nothing sells at asking price. So they they pick the highest price car that's most similar to theirs, and they just base it on that, and that's what they want. They're not interested if I earn any money. They'd rather me just, rather me lose money. So, um, you know, that's what I want. I get, like, what, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in property. Okay. Well, maybe you should be a car dealer, <laughs> because you know more about what this car's going to make and what it's not going to make and how much I'm going to earn. Without without my help, you can do it all. Just crack on. Yeah. So yeah. How, how are you valuing cars? Obviously, experience is one. But you're looking at other things like te- looking at auto trader, checking all the cars look, on there. You you have to look at the market. Um. Obviously, you have to. We're lucky enough that we buy and sell a lot of cars, which range from a lot of models. So within a period of time, a short period of time, we would have had experience with a similar car to what we're valuing. So you look back at what you bought that for, what you sold that for. Is the market better or worse? How many are for sale? What's the spec like? There's a lot more than just going on auto trader, seeing a car at 100 grand and going, right, it's worth 95. Yeah. You know, so it's... But the way things have been recently, the, the, the market's been incredible. You could, you could probably... Someone could get by by doing that because, y- you know... You can't give too much money for a car at the minute. They're just they're going up and up and up and up and up. Do you see that changing anytime soon? I think it's got to change, um, and I think it's on the cusp of changing. Um, but new cars, as long as I think I think business and life is all about supply and demand. So if the demand is more than the supply, that material thing is worth always worth more. But if the supply is worth more than the demand it goes down. You can't get new cars at the minute. You know, whatever it may be, you can't get a new Volkswagen Golf. From a Volkswagen Golf to a new Urus to, to you can't get anything. So I think as long as um as long as supply stays like that, new cars will always do well, which then brings up old, um used cars because I can't buy a new one. I want one today. I've got to go and buy a six month, a twelve month old one and pay new money for it. What do you think is is probably the best investment for a car to appreciate over the next, let's say, five years? It's impossible to say. Right. There's, there's. But if you had to buy one, <laughs> and you had to make money, and the most money you think you could make buying one car, sitting on it, leaving it in the garage, perfect model. What would you, what would you buy? A Pagani Huayra. Right. Okay. Which I did two years ago. Right. So I just think they were super undervalued. Is that the one you got a video with on YouTube? Y- maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we did do a video of me collecting it and stuff. But it's, it's one of 100 cars. It's one of four supplied to the UK. It's an incredible brand. Another family business. Yeah. Incredible brand, incredible car. And I just think they're undervalued. I'd done the same thing with a... I had a Bugatti. A Bugatti Veyron. I bought it. I had it for five years. Done seventeen or 18,000 miles in it. And doubled my money. I'd just seen a gap in the market where I thought, that's a cool car. I like them. And God, they're cheap. They're under six hundred. Probably about the time you bought six it. Six fifty. I paid for. Yes, yeah. I was looking the exact same time. I didn't mm. buy one. Next they're time now, I come around, now one and a quarter. Yeah, one and a quarter million. Mm. That was in like two thousand and sixteen. I think. Yeah, yeah that's when I bought mine. Is that when you bought yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was looking at the exact same time. <laughs> but 
I didn't think it was going to go up that much. But, you know, it, w- with you, no disrespect, you're looking at it and you think it's undervalued, but you don't really know because it's not your profession. 100%. How can I expect Joe Bloggs or you, somebody, to trust my valuations if I don't trust them myself? I see something and I put my money where my mouth is. I'm not going to tell you a Bugatti is a good investment unless I've got one first. Yeah. Easy. Someone's probably thinking, okay, so w- why don't you just buy loads of Bugattis? Why not buy loads of Aeron's? But you, back then, if you could have bought <laughs> 10 at 650, we all would have bought them. Yeah. You know, that was the right thing to do. Is it, it's just getting your hands on them. You couldn't. Yeah. Is yeah, it left hand drive? All left hand drive. All of them are left hand drive. Even what's the new one? Chiron. Chiron. They're all left hand drive, yeah. Right. All of them. You've got one? Uh, I haven't got a Chiron at the minute, but I've had a Chiron. I think Aleem. Is Aleem the only one in the UK with one? No. There's no. There's. Um, oh, God. I bet there's 50 in the UK. Is there? Yeah. So they make more than the Veyron's? Yeah, they made more than the very ones. They did, okay. Yeah. Where do you see that, that price going to? Well, you know, if you look at the price of a Chiron um, a year ago, they were well under cost price. So a car would cost two and a half million, two point seven, depending on spec. And, you know, I've had them and sold them at 2.1, 2.2, so half a million pound behind list. But recently, supply and demand... Is, is gone up. See, for me, if I'm spending two and a half, two and a half million on a car, I'm getting a, an Enzo. If well, it's not going to get you there anymore. But well, yeah, you probably get an Enzo. You get an Enzo for two and a half million. But okay, this is my question to you because that's a really, really, really good car to say. Why? Have, why have you said Enzo? Just because I like it. I think it. It's one of the top. Not. Top, it's one of the top tier Ferraris in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So I would probably. I would like to, if I was going to buy a car to keep and not touch, it would be probably an Enzo. Mm-hmm. But there's no real valuation behind it. I just personally feel like for an expensive car that could hold its value. I don't know how many were made. I haven't actually looked into it or anything. So Enzos, they were 399 made. They ended up making 400 because they made one for the Pope and they presented it to the Pope. Uh, that was sold at auction and went to, where well, all uh. the funds went to charity. Um, so that car is a very valuable car. That was a black one. Um, Normally, there's 10% of the total build value supplied to the UK. So there's probably 40 supplied to the UK. It's an incredible looking car. And it's named after the founder of Ferrari. I mean, that's a blue chip investment car. That's a car where two years ago, you know, you couldn't pay too much money for one. If you paid 10, 15% over market price for a car, which I know lots of people that did, and you thought, God, you're mad. And two years gone by, and all of a sudden they're twenty five percent better off. Yeah, I think it was like one point seven when I was looking. God, I've bought and sold Enzos for five hundred grand. Five hundred when they were new. I know, but yeah, one point four five or one point six, I think they were actually when I was looking. So five hundred. They yeah, they were they were like four hundred and something list, and they obviously immediately went straight over list. So bef- between five hundred and six hundred, the first few cars, they then jumped to a million, pretty quick like within the first eight months. And then they've just never stopped. Where do you think the ceiling is, though? Where's the ceiling on any car? I mean, how come some classic Ferraris make 15 million quid, 30 million quid, 40 million quid? You know, what va- What brings out that value? There's just been a Mercedes sold for $146 million. No way. What was it made out of gold? <laughs> it was a special car. There was only two. Bond or something? No, it was um, it was um, you know a a, a, a three hundred SL Goldwing. You know the, the yes, old yes, with the gold yes, doors. yes. So this was like this was called a three hundred SLR. So it was like a, a race version of the three hundred SL Goldwing, and they only made two, and they were both Mercedes race work cars. So they were never privately owned. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of dough. Are those the cars that l- lead the F1? Um, so Mercedes, what do you mean the um, the like safety cars? Yeah, the safety cars. So um, the safety car of Merce- is a Mercedes um, in F1. This is a 19, God, what would it be? Oh, it would be a 50, a mid-50s car, Nin- you know, 1950s something. One Mealy Mealy, Sterling Moss drove it. You know, it was, it was, it, I mean, it's just like the holy grail of cars. Would that be a type of car that you would try and get your hands on? To s- oh, that was well, you wouldn't even be able to, would you? I'm assuming that's pure. Auction. Well, you know, no. Uh, well, yes, that one was, but you know, there's been there's been things similarish. Um, obviously, not quite that value, of course, but um, similarish that you know you know of. And 
people entrust you. They're not cars that can be advertised because they're not they're not going to sell in an advert. You have to know the person who is going to go to. Yeah. And the seller would entrust us if we can't buy it. He would entrust us to know the person that's going to buy it, and you know, make sure the deal's done right. Because you probably have to get a, m- a middleman for something of that value. Yeah, of course. And and I'm the middleman. Right. So um and also when you when you when you're dealing in, in that kind of money, you know, solicitors are, are involved. It's like buying a it's like buying a building, basically. Has anyone ever made an offer to you in crypto to buy a car? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> and I've I've taken it. Um and I'm having something set up at the minute where I I do take crypto. So in the next three or four weeks I will take crypto for, for cars. What what uh what coins? Bitcoin and Ethereum. 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 Yeah, just yeah. those two. Just yeah. those two. Yeah, yeah. Just those two. Even if you just acce- if you just accepted Bitcoin, that would be good enough because everyone would just change into it. Yeah, I think I think Bitcoin is obviously. I don't know much about um, crypto coins. If I'm honest, I'm quite scared. That's a market that I'm really scared of. That and NFTs. I just I can't get my head around it. I just can't. I, I people people I talk to about it. It's like they're talking Spanish to me. Yeah, they just lose me immediately. I know you're quite big into it, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just, I can't get my head around it. And th- I sort of use it, if I'm honest, as a a bargaining chip to people to sell cars to. In the sense of, I say, look, you invest in three million quid in a coin that doesn't exist, that has absolutely no security whatsoever at the minute. It could disappear. It could disappear. Could, yeah. It, it could double, treble, ten times overnight. But it could also disappear. Why not put your three million quid in something that you can touch and drive and enjoy and love? And if it falls by 50% in value and the world ends and we go to war and you've still, that's yours, you've still got it. You know, you're not going to turn on your computer one day and it just be gone. And I think for that reason, um, people are buying big investment cars for that kind of reason. There's, there's so much money out there, especially in the UK. There's so much money in the UK. It's unbelievable. There's really. a lot of overseas money too coming to the UK as yeah, well. Yeah, Sa- yeah. A lot of Saudis. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, I mean, you know, it, it's quite, it's quite unfathomable how much there is when you dig in and you talk to certain people and they're like, you know, I've got, I've got 15 million to put in to invest in some cars, and like that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. What's the worst deal you've ever made? Uh, the worst deal from from a standpoint of you've l- the most money you've lost. Oh, um, look, you 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 lose money on on stuff all the time. Um, it's part and parcel of the game. You can't win every time, but our success rate is pretty good. If I'm honest, we don't lose very much. Um, it's not really money that I've lost on a car. I'd call a bad deal, and it's money that cars are worth now that we've had and sold. That I think, well, that was a bad deal. But at the same time, I would have earned money out of that car and I wanted to sell it and I was happy I did sell it. And, you know, the money from that deal went on and made me more money on somewhere else. So you can't look back with a seller's remorse and think, oh, if only, if only, if only, you know? Because the way I look at things is like I had the same conversation with someone in uh, about crypto the other day. They told me they had 10 or 15,000 quid in five five or six bitcoins and he said um if i'd have just harmed to it by now it'd be worth xyz and i said but but you didn't but you didn't <laughs> and you're out you had so many outs before you got to today's value you know if if it would have been worth 10 percent more than what you sold it for you then would have sold it you, you, you're not going to hang on to it forever you know i doubt there's anyone that's i mean is there anyone in the world that's got a bitcoin that had one from nearly day dot uh, there will, the will be, yeah. Do you there think so? Be, yeah, for sure, there will be. But there's a lot of people that claim to have been in Bitcoin a long, long time ago, but they really haven't. Mm. But there will be, definitely will be some people for sure. There, there'll be people as well that have forgot their password to their wallet or have bought some stuff and forgot about it. And oh, can you imagine? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wallets out there that have got just idle Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever that, have never been reopened, just been touched. There's a lot of uh, drug That's smuggling scary, and stuff that goes through it and a lot of money. And obviously once that goes... The people go to prison or whatever, or they 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 bury the code yeah, or yeah, to, yeah. Their, to their locked wallet or whatever. Then they kind of but lose I th- it all. I think this is another reason why um, Bitcoin has um, accelerated so much. I, I think 
you know, it's for those people who are into money laundering and, and stuff like that, it's such an easy way to get money from one place to another, from one country to another, yeah. to one account to another. You know, it's, it's absolutely no questions asked, unsecured. You know, I've got a Bitcoin. It's worth 30,000 quid in America. It's worth 30,000 quid in China. It's worth 30,000 quid in the UK. And I can sell it anywhere sitting at my computer. You know, it's it's... That's why it's so valuable. You don't need to get a banker involved. No, no, no one needs to, to call no one. FCA approved or anything. It's just, you know. No 20 grand limits, 25 grand limits. Done. Yeah. And that's scary to me. It's cool, but it's it's scary. And I have no I have no use for it. And I'd simply, simply be gambling. Do you instantly sell it? If, if I was to buy a car for you today for crypto, are you, are you instantly selling it the same? At today's price. I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just use it as a form of payment. Yeah. I use watches as a form of payment. Houses, well, boats, okay. planes, helicopters. So how are you valuing the watches and, or, or things like that? Well, Do you have external people? You yeah, just say, how much would you... It started off, I had external people. And then, you know, I would look at... I'd look at a guy, so I I've, I've took a 50 grand watch in. And he would value it at 50. I'd give the customer 50. I'd get 50, so it didn't make any difference. Then he would sell it for 65. And I think... Why can't I sell it to 65? Because he's selling it to the same people who I deal with. Mm. You know, it's the same clientele. So the majority of the time, I, when I take something in, I, I, I sell it myself. Um, unless it's something really special, I can't, I can't put a value on it. Um, would so you have someone lined up ready to buy it or would you keep no, it? No, 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 I'd stock it. Okay. It's just another unit. So where would you advertise that unit? To people who I know. I know, I know people who are car collectors, watch collectors, right. friends who would say, you know, or always game to buy a watch or something. You know, it's, it's 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 an easy thing to sell. And you look at companies who sell watches, watch um, dealers, and you say, okay, well, their watch is 65 grand. You can have this for 60. Okay, good deal. They know it's coming from me. It's a proper thing, you know, because I've done all my checks anyway. So I just learned the market a bit more as I've gone along. Things like helicopters and boats and stuff, <laughs> I that's a minefield. So I just purely underwrite that through through another agency and but similar people to myself who i trust and i know if they give me a price that's their price and they'll pay me not none of this because you have bad experiences someone gives you a price for a boat all of a sudden you own a 70 foot boat in mallorca that you have no idea what it's worth and someone said oh actually our checkbook's closed we're not buying at the minute you're like this is nice <laughs> what we're gonna do with this boat you know so yeah, what do you think about the Lamborghini yacht? It's cool, isn't it? It's so cool. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. It's cool. Conor McGregor's got one. Yeah, he's got one. I think he was like one of the first. Was it like four million euros or something? Yeah, they they started at like two point nine million. Yeah, but obviously now they've probably gone up in value like everything else. Probably yeah. in now four million quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously I can imagine the demand's unbelievable for him. I'm yeah. assuming they gave him one of the first ones for maybe marketing, marketing of course. purposes. Look how many people would want to buy no, one. It's doubtful. He probably does, but it's doubtful if he does even own it. Yeah, you know, Lamborghini could give it to him for 12, 12 or eighteen months. Get seen in Dubai, in Monaco, in Saint Tropez with this boat. All of a sudden, because he's a cool guy, and he Connor, he's <laughs> like he's he's amazing, and you know he's he's incredibly marketable. You know, you put a watch on him, or put a shirt on him, or put a pair of trainers on him. I do it. I look at him and I go, oh, I like them trainers. You know, I'll go and buy a set of them trainers. You know, he's 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 great. Would you put him in one of your cars for marketing tool? Um. It's different with second hand because I don't make the car and I'm not going to take orders for that car. Okay, would well you put him in a car at a loss for marketing purposes? Definitely. Yeah. I think that would be smart because I think you can imagine how... Yeah, you could imagine... It wouldn't be a loss because for him Correct. for him to... For, for you to call him up and say, look, I need you to do me an Instagram post, you, you, you know, I don't know what he would charge, but it's going to be probably more than what the car's worth. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a loss. Yeah. Um, a, f a friend of mine actually uh, a funny story. This is this is a funny story. Um, I want. Yeah, I don't think he'd mind me mentioning this story. Um, he owned a clothing brand, um, and he's recently sold it. And he, a young kid, bought some cars from me. Really, really, really nice guy. Made made some money and um, loves cars. He came over to me and he buying a Lamborghini and he said, "Right, he said, I'm going over to Hurricane. Uh, eh? Hurricane. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. I know you're on about. You know you're on about. Yeah. He said, I'm going over to um I'm going over to Belfast and um he said I'm going to not Belfast, I'm going over to Dublin. I'm going to um see Conor McGregor, he's wearing one, one of my t shirts tonight. So I was like, Okay. And 
he said, oh yeah, he's, he's cost me, I don't know at the time, 50 or 70 grand just to wear, it, just to put a t-shirt on for, for, for a picture. And I thought he was mad. I was like, this is, this is insane. You're going to see him. You're not going to spend the evening like in his company. He's going to, he's going to get out of the car, put a black t-shirt on, take a picture and you're going to pay him. He's like, yeah. Anyway, a week later, he made the 70 grand back 10 times over, you know, just because of that one post. And that's what, that's why these like Kardashians and stuff like that, that's why, you know, they're, they're like, are they a million dollars a post or something? Probably, but yeah, probably, yeah. yeah that's a joke, isn't it? Yeah. Just for a post. Two and a quarter of a million, two million pound a post, <laughs> which is ridiculous just for posting more on Instagram. God, I'd, I'd post so much, it'd be unbelievable. <laughs> I'd be like a proper Instagram whore, just posting everything. You would, wouldn't you? Hats, gloves, sun, sunglasses. I know, I know. <laughs> all sorts. It's, it's, it's a hard thing because you can't, as you say, you can, get, you, can't, you can get addicted to it and get carried away and then you kind of, your followers kind of then lose interest in you because you kind of become a sellout at that yeah, point. Yeah, do you know what? Believe it or not, obviously on a completely different scale, I get messaged all the time from people. I say, Carl, we've got a car cleaning product. You know, for a post, 750 quid, 1,000 quid, will you just post it? And I, d I mean, it's, it's quite, it's, it's, it's tempting because it's, it's a picture. But then I lower myself, I lower my brand by putting my brand involved with the company. I have no idea if their product is even any good or not. So, I just, I just don't do it. But there is definitely a, there's definitely a living to be made out there somewhere. Yeah, over. absolutely. I mean, I mean, and social media, you know, you, you can make so many, so much money, so many different ways. I mean, we had a little chat before about your social media. Y you've got into kind of filming yourself, filming videos and stuff. Are you going to continue to carry that on? I wish I had more time to do it. I wish I could do more stuff. The problem is I don't, you know, no one would want to follow and see my videos if we weren't successful and if I, all I'd done was shoot videos all day I wouldn't buy and sell many cars so there's a balance I need to find um, I've got a really really good videographer and photographer and he's um, he's great he does a great job that's actually how we were introduced to each other through a previous um, guy Ryan who we uh, who, who used to do some stuff for me um, and he's always called people are messaging me on YouTube they want to see a video of this they want to see you in this they want to see you do that but you know, a 15, 20 minute video takes all, takes one day to film and takes two days to edit. It's, it's, it's madness. You know, you, you, you do a drive by shot and all of a sudden so another car will come in the distance yeah. and they'll go, no, I'm not happy to do it again. Turn around, back again, drive by again, same thing. And then we want to get this right, that right. Then it starts to rain and then you got to, oh, and then oh, halfway through, I'm like, I've got to go. I've got, I've got to see this guy I'll be back in an hour. One hour turns into three. Next thing you know, you're now on a second day filming this one car. So it's hard work. It is. What you could do is almost just do it as a just a, a week in the life, or just do one. You know, every. I've done. Two I've done a video, um, a day in the life, and I haven't launched it because we had so many requests um, for get follow Carl around for a day. We want to see what he does in a day. You know, we want to see a, a day in the life of Carl, and. We, we were actually starting to film a video of a new car that I'd bought, a new Maserati MC20. And in the video, in the, on the day, I took the, my vide videographer with me because he had to film the collection of the car and stuff like that. But during that, I'd bought another car. We'd ended up somewhere else. My wife's called me, she said, we're going out tonight, organise a driver, it's someone's birthday. And I'm like, shit, fuck, I completely forgot it was their birthday. We're going out and I'm trying to organise a driver. At the same time, I'm buying cars on the phone. It was, and my guy said to me, he said, this is the video. He said, this is the day in the life video. And he filmed it and he'd done it and he's edited it. He edited it about two months ago. And he said, um, should we launch it? And I don't know, I'm just, I find it a bit cringe. Yeah. So I said, no. I don't find the video is a good video. But I just think the thumbtag would be a day in the life of Carl Hartley. Like, why would someone want to watch that? But, but people do, actually. People love it. It's <laughs> yeah. almost like the worst the video is, the more people like the rawness of yeah, it. Yeah. It's what I'm saying. That might be a good ground for you just to have a raw video. I know, and it is. Having followed that, but you almost don't care what he's filming. Just let him film and then just get him to edit it together. Get him to edit it, yeah. But, yeah. And, um, and so the video is ready to go, but... He said to me, I said, I just don't know. I said, I think my friend's going to rip the piss out of me. <laughs> you know, like, who do you think you are? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, but it is a good video and it's, a good, it's actually a good watch. 
It's tricky, isn't it? Because obviously you you know it's a great business avenue, but it does take so much of your time. Like even this podcast just takes a lot of time, and it, it's not like it makes me money. So it's like the third thing on my list. The main mm-hmm. thing is building my businesses. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But the people that you know really like you and want to watch you all the time, they kind of just do f- forget a little bit about that. Which I would too if I'm really interested. Well, where's the next video? Where's the next yeah, video? Yeah, but yeah. obviously, it's not the first thing on your list because it's not what made you where you are. Exactly. And it's, tr- it's it's super tricky because what comes with I know from you yourself could probably be you make videos. People, the people that then start emailing you and trying to waste your time about cars and stuff, you know, it probably gets a little bit. Of, too much. You know what? I'm actually really fortunate. You'd think that, you know, with so many followers or, or whatever, that you'd get a lot of people just um, time wasting. And but I, I don't. I think I think everyone's got that respect that they realise that you know th- this guy is a professional. Like I'm, I'm going to make myself look like an idiot here. And I, I, believe it or not, I don't get any. I get some stupid messages sometimes, but that's it. I don't get any phone calls. People calling the showroom up and saying. Oh, I've got five Enzos I want to sell, and do you know all this stuff? It's like, it's. And I, I thought I would. I thought I'd get that a lot with social media, but but I don't. Where's your plan to take the company? Is is, is your dad ever going to retire, and you're fully <laughs> going to take the reins? Um, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Um, y- y- we work together so well, and look, he's he's in a very fortunate position where he he does what he wants when he wants. Some days he wants to go and play golf. He'll go and play golf. Some days, if he should be on the golf course, he'll think, you know what? I'm sick of sitting here. I've got to get out, drive to the end of the earth and try and buy a car somewhere. At 61 years old, he doesn't need to do that, but he needs to do it for his own mental health because he'd be feel like caged in, you know? So he has absolute, complete freedom. Um, and, you know, he lives he lives a good life because of that. If he doesn't want to go and see a customer that day or he's got plans where he wants... He, he just does what he wants. Where I am slightly different, I have to prioritize um, the business more because I'm not in his position, you know? So, um, and so, you know, he doesn't, so he shouldn't have to be. So he, he, he does what he wants and he, when he, I think if my dad fully retired, he would go insane. What is the current, I forgot to ask earlier, what is the current stock holding? Uh, well, actually, we we done it. We done account um, the end. We do account at the end of every month. Mm-hmm. So today's the tenth of June. So um, I think it was twenty four twenty four something million um, ten days ago. Sale price or no, cost price? No, that's cost price. Right. Okay. How do you project? How do you project your turnover into the future for a business like yours? You can't. You can't. Our turnover last month was three times what it was the month before. Like there's no consistency at all. Right. There's you. D- uh, you never know what phone calls coming next. You don't know what cars you're going to buy next week. You don't know what the world's going to do next week. We're buying and selling predominantly a depreciating asset. So you might go through a dry spell and keep a car for two months. All of a sudden, what you thought you might have had ten percent profit profit in, you've lost ten percent. There's there's no. Like you've got a big whiteboard there. If I was coming to you to sell the company, for example, I could show you profits earned. I could show you predictions, but the predictions that there's nothing to go by. They're just, you know, the business has gone up X, Y, Z in the last five years per year. So you project that it's going to do the same thing. But, you know, it's it's how hard you work. Have you ever been approached to, to, for someone to buy your business? Yeah. Was that based on the brand or based on the stock holding? Based the on the thing? brand, I was approached. Someone wanted to franchise um, the name, and to be honest, um, I w- I would kind of th- I would kind of thought about it, but then I thought, okay, you've got another showroom somewhere that's using our name that we're getting a share of their profits for for them using our name. Plus, they've they've bought they've bought the franchise to use our name. But what about if that dealership turns into every other dealership that's around? What I think makes us unique is me and my dad, us being there. So if I'm leaving it to Joe Bloggs and five of his staff or ten of his staff, they give someone a, a bad service, all of a sudden that person then no longer comes to me to buy a car anymore because they had a bad experience with Tom Hartley. So it was, I think, I think there was a lot more risk involved. 
than um, than just just looking at numbers. You know, numbers were very attractive, but in the long run, I don't think it, I don't think it would have worked out. So you're gonna st- you stick into the UK, or are you yourself gonna fr- are you gonna franchise yourself? No, to well, look, but you know, uh, someone said to me the other day, I answered the phone, um, and you know, good afternoon, Tom Hartley. They was like, oh, hi, Tom, and I was like, oh no, it's Carl, and they was like, oh, sorry, um, I, I thought I thought you said your name was Tom, and I was like, you know, Janet from Coca Cola doesn't answer the phone. Hello, Janet. You know, it's it's Janet from Coca Cola. You know, um, I I have. I, I I would you know what we do we do together we're a team we're a partnership and I think reaching out ne- we've just branched out into into central London so we're now got offices in Knightsbridge the next step has got to be offices abroad it has to be especially with Brexit you didn't I didn't need them before Brexit because you could buy and sell cars in and out of the EU with no stress it's no big deal I bought a car from Germany get it in, get it UK registered, it costs you nothing, it's fine. Now it's 20%. So I've lost a lot of EU business. So we need offices in the EU. Where about in the EU, Richard? Don't go? know yet. Don't know. Don't what know what yet. about further afield? Dubai, anything like that? I think Dubai's been done. Right. Dubai's been milked. There's so many dealers in Dubai. Um, and you got to look at language barriers. You know, I can't even read the writing. I don't really know the culture. These are things that if you're setting up a business, you, you have to you have to know these things. So um, the States maybe. Okay. The States might be good. Um, I love Europe though. Um, and just gives me a, a reason to live in Europe. <laughs> yeah, Europe's, I think, Europe, you know what? The UK is one of the best countries in the world. But it's so underappreciated by the people that live here, in my opinion. Especially because Europe's close. You've got so many beautiful countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Europe's great. The UK is, I know things have gotten worse safety-wise, especially in London, but um, the UK is a fantastic place. It's safe. The UK is a safe place compared to everywhere else in the world. There's, there's loads of money in the UK for people to start businesses and to earn money. There's loads of opportunity. The only thing we don't have, which would make this country by far the best country in the world, is the weather. You give us a few nice beaches and, you know, the, the Spanish summer, it's the ultimate. Yeah, we ha- and we have actually got some incredible beaches. Yeah, no, it's we have. It's just, just consi- don't get used. Yeah, it's just the consistency of the weather, as you say. This summer, last this time last year, was heat wave. Yeah. This year, yeah. I mean, where is the sun? We've no. had nothing. We've had nothing, no. Which is crazy. But as kind of your career has progressed, how has your mentality changed towards business, towards people? Um, well, like we said earlier, my mentality changed I mean, I love cars. I'm a car lover. And you have to love what you do. And I love cars. But my love got so strong for business whilst having a love for cars and, and making money from cars. So um, my mentality has changed a bit where, you know, it's nice to buy and sell special things and make people's, you know, life dream of buying that specific car come true. But, you know, it's nice to also look at the profit sheet at the end of the month and go, okay, that was good. Yeah. You know, I want to do I want to do more of that. Or next month, we've got to do more. Or last month was shit. We've got we to gotta go harder next month, you know. So that's what motivates me more than, more than anything, really. I get no motivation out of buying a car, selling a car, and not earning any money out of it. Do you ever see your kids getting involved in the business? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I've got three kids, right. two daughters and a son. It's my son's birthday today. Oh, cool. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'd love all three of them to... to How old are they now? Um, my daughter was five last week. My son's four today. And my youngest is two and a half. Right, okay. Yeah, Yeah, two and a half years between the three of them. I bet they... Look <laughs> they look like triplets. <laughs> really? Yeah. So the four-year-old and five-year-old are the same height. And... The two and a half year old is smaller, but she's got the same face as the other two. <laughs> she literally has the same face, so it's um it's amazing watching them running around. We just we just me and my wife just decided we're going to have. We had one, um, then she was really lucky, and we fell for another um, by accident whilst the baby was three months old. And then when we were that in, she was like, "We're in for a penny, in for a pound." You know, <laughs> if we're gonna do, if we're gonna do this again, we've got to go now. So we've done it again, and um, I think I'm I think I'm done. 
I think I'm done Why now. Why three? Why not two? Or one? Well, I was happy with two because right. I had a girl and a boy. Yeah. There was one year between them. Like, pfft, you can have whatever car you want. You know, nice cars have four seats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and she sprung a surprise on me with, uh, with, with, the, with the youngest. But you know what? The youngest, oh my God, she's made the family. Really? Like, she's absolutely made the family. She's incredible. Petra, she's unbelievable. Uh, her personality is just, she's like mini me. So my daughter's like my wife, my oldest. My son is like the most kind-hearted person, very soft, um, very kind. I don't know who he takes after because that's neither me or my wife. <laughs> and um, Petra, the youngest, she's like she's like watching me. She just can't keep still. She's always looking at something. She's always trying to get somewhere she shouldn't be or do something she shouldn't do. And it's, it's she, I just, she's just amazing. So have they taken uh, uh, the oldest one at the moment? she taking an interest at all in in the cars and stuff? yeah no they are yeah they yeah. are my, my son my son and my daughter um the four and five year old they they know their um makes of cars so if they see um if they see a, a a lamborghini they know it's a lamborghini they know the difference between a lamborghini and a ferrari they know my wife's got a mercedes um like they, they know the badges and stuff um so it reminds me of me when i was when i was that age that's, like, that's how you start you know are they going to get a car at 12 or 14? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> They're going to have to earn it, though. Take them to... Take them to um, yeah, so h- yeah, how, how are you going to um, navigate that? I'm going to let I'm gonna let nature take its course, like it did with me. I wasn't pushed into this business. I used to go to primary school, got to 10 or 11 years old, and I used to skip school the first Tuesday of every month and go to Misham Car Auction. And I used to sit... No one knew this. I used to sit with one of my dad's friends who's um, been a lifelong friend. He's, he's, he's still very close to me now. His son's very close to me. And um, we used to sit at the back of the auction. And I'm 11 years old. The auctioneers, they wouldn't take my bids, obviously, because I'm bidding on yeah. cars. Yeah. At the time, you know, 40, 50,000 pound cars. They wouldn't take my bids. So I'd get him to bid for me. And he's like, are you sure you want to bid again? Yeah, yeah, bid, bid again, bid again, bid again. And then he had to go and sort everything out. And, um, you know, I was given a lot of freedom when I was younger. If I came back and I'd, I'd bought three cars and two of them earned money and one of them didn't, it was okay. It was, it was that I was, I was showing initiative and, you know, I, I, you've you got you to learn by your mistakes. But I was given just freedom. And that's what I'd like to do with my kids. If my kids want to be doctors or astronauts or whatever they want to be, I will support them all the way. But I would love them to turn around and go, Dad, I want to do what you do. Yeah, that's amazing, boy. Your dad giving you that type of freedom. So. Yeah, it's same with me and my brother. We um we just we just had free reign. Just free reign, and it was a risk for him, obviously. But you know, he obviously seen something in us, thought that we were ready, and okay, let's see if they are ready. And then when we were ready, we were ready. So I'm in the stage now where I don't want to be at school. I'm 11, 12 years old. I'm getting to the end of primary school. It's going to be start going to secondary school. And I'm like, look, once you go to secondary school, I'm here till I'm 16. You know, I'm, I'm not the most academically bright person in the world. I can count, which is key can speak to people i can speak to people but you don't learn that in school mm. you, you learn that on the streets in business in life in real day situations how to deal with situations you learn how to speak to people and i said look dad I'm, i i don't want to go to school so he said well, what are you going to do i said i'm going to buy and sell cars so he said look son listen to me you can try and buy and sell cars if you want to but if it doesn't work out you got no qualifications You've got, you've got nothing. You've got no experience in anything else. So I said, okay, well, let's see. And he said, look, okay. I was 12 at the time. He said, obviously the business wasn't as big then as what it is now. Um, he said, you're 12 years old. He said, you've got until you're 18 years old to buy a third of this company, including the stock. So when you get to 18, I'm expecting you to put your third in, because at the time my brother and my dad was working together. You need to... You need to earn enough money. And by the way, it was a case of if I bought a car and the car earned three thousand pounds, a thousand go to me, a thousand go to my dad, a thousand go to my brother. 
you know? So it wasn't a case of that car's earned 3,000 pounds, I keep the three. So I had to, I was just given an ultimatum. If, if you can afford to buy a third of this business by the time you're 18, then you're a partner. And that was my, that was only the only motivation I needed. Were you given the money or was the money just left in the company for you? No, the money's in the company. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, yeah, yeah. Okay. Money's in the company and I've got to, I've got, I've got to earn a third of, earn personally a third of the stock and the business and then put it back in. <laughs> right. Okay. Then put it back in when I'm, when I'm 18. And my brother was given the same, the same opportunity. I call it an opportunity. It was an opportunity. Um, and we made it work. Do you know what I think is great, though? I mean, you didn't have to do that. I mean, you, you could have probably just sat back, lived off your dad's name. You don't know my dad. Okay. okay. <laughs> no. And obviously, that's why you are where you are today. But people probably have a, a misconception of, you know, yeah. you only got here because of your dad. But clearly not. And I, and I say this to a lot of people, okay, whether someone's dad or, or family is rich anyway, if they make a name for themselves or they choose to get into that business and build something from it, then they've, they, they didn't have to do that, but they've done that. Yeah, we were... So there's there's four kids. There's there's me and my brother, and I've got two sisters. And my two sisters are involved with other businesses that my dad has. Um, but me and my brother, I th I feel would trep very differently. We're very um, sort of um, military regimented. You know, seven o'clock in the morning, the door would spring open like you were being raided. Get up, get up, go to work. Get up, get up, get up. So you're like, shit, get up, you're brushing your teeth, trying to brush your hair, and you're half falling asleep because you were on your mobile last night until yeah. half 11 at night or whatever, you know, talking to friends or whatnot. <laughs> and, you know, you'd get to the point where um, you had to grow up very fast. And when my friends would break up from school at um, 14, 15, 16 or whatever, and they're like, right, it's, it's Tuesday, we're going to... Uh, party in the park or we're going to somewhere or, or, or whatever you know I can't I can't do that I've got responsibilities I've got a, a, I've got some money I need to earn you know and it, it, it took a bit of like childhood stuff away from me but at the same time I was doing things that kids at that age could only dream of doing so you can't have it all you can't be a kid and be an adult at the same time um so it, you know it was a it was a really, um, it, and that's where that's where you learn you learn life. I think at, at that kind of age. Did you inspire any of the people around you at that point and kind of drag them along with you? I, I, I friends that I've got now, I had then. You know, we were friends for a reason. They or, they already had it in them. You know, you grow you grow away from people, um, and you can grow closer to people. But the people that I've got a very close section of friends, not many of them, and they that we were friends from day one and we're still friends and they're very successful in their own right. And I think that just gives you a common ground where it, maybe you bounce off of each other. You know, I bounced off of a lot of my friends, not just me dragging them, they drag me as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think so. And not to say that I mean like anything, whether, you know, your friends from day one are successful or not. I was just wondering, um, you know, because a lot of people around... Let's say me and my friends, when we started into business, they became successful too just because they'd seen what we've been Well, yeah, doing. of course. But I've also got friends that are just not interested in being successful, which I love because they're not interested in taking anything from me. I'm not, they're not interested in business conversations, which is also cool. Great. You know what I mean? It's great. My best friend knows nothing about cars. Right. Knows absolutely zero about cars. So you never go out for a meal and he's asking you about cars. He has no idea. He doesn't know. Which is nice. Isn't which it? is great. <laughs> which is it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but what what would stray me away from people? It, I like people who I've got things in common with. And if I can talk about sports or I can talk about cars, obviously, or, or business, that's, that's your conversations, you know? That's it really, isn't it? Yeah. Apart from local gossip, like that's, that's your conversations. If I can't talk to someone about them three things, they could, they could be the nicest person in the world and they could think I'm a nice person, but we're not going to, we're not going to click, you know? So you have to have something in common with people. Um, but um, the fact that some or most of my friends are successful, very successful, has got nothing to do with, you know, we were friends when we were 11, you know, or, or, or younger. It's just you you bounce off each other, don't you? If you could, just before we end, if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? 
I think a, a massive key in life, and not that I didn't have it, I did, I was brought up with manners, but I didn't realise how important manners really is and treating people the right way. And um, it costs nothing to be nice. And I think if you live by that at a young age and take that forward in your life, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get on better. You, know, you get on with people better. You get on in life better. And life will treat you better. Yeah, I think that's true. Very, very much true. But no, I appreciate you coming on. And Thank you. You know, obviously coming down to London if you wasn't already here. Appreciate you coming down and, and, and replying to me and actually coming on. <laughs> I said to you before, it's so hard to get guests on. Like people will agree to come on and then, you know, three, four months might pass and they don't come on, which is just so tricky because I want to get episodes out for people. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, it's well, it, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you, you asked me to come on. I respect you a lot, what you've done. Um, you're you're a nice person with it as well. Um, you're just very just you're down to earth. You're just a normal person. No, I appreciate that. And um, you. you you don't get many people like that. And um, you know, respect to you. Thank you very much. If anyone wants to follow Carl on Instagram, yep. Carl Hartley One. You can follow the company Tom Hartley Cars. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but to be fair, I don't really use it. So just <laughs> just stay to Instagram. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you.